Class K aberrations. Now, we have approximated things in the past with the paraxial approximation, and now we have to face reality and admit the things that we have neglected. And these are the aberrations. Then we'll look at the prism. Uh, the prism is very, very uh, nice uh, to analyze and how to measure the index of refraction of glass by shining a laser beam at a prism to find the minimum angle of deviation. And then we'll look at an engineering problem that involves solving the difficulty of chromatic aberration using a converging and diverging lens. We will also explain a few things about how the eye corrects for aberrations. But before we get started, we're going to finish up something from last class on the solar eclipse. J12, the last thing is more of a little, uh, let's say, dessert. We're going to look at, we started here with the pinhole camera. We're going to end with the pinhole camera. And here, notice the little uh, images of the sun here with the moon doing a little cookie cut, uh, cutting out, uh, biting, biting a uh, cookie cut out of the sun. Look at the little images of the sun uh, with the moon taking a little bite. I remember Alan Comer, chair of biology, saying this. It was very fascinating. We had a moment together, all right, where physics and biology came together because of astronomy, all right. And here, back many years ago, I couldn't believe it that these holes, uh, there's holes here. Uh, now, not these big ones, the small ones, I'll show you in a second. These holes projected here, well, projected, actually, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. There really is no projection or no focusing. The light, you see the little uh, moons eating up the sun here in this small holes. These are meteorology majors. The Atmospheric Science Department just got born uh, through physics. Uh, I'm proud of my role in there. I helped uh, give birth to the atmospheric science. It broke out of physics. Uh, and as chair of physics, I hired, basically hired on the first, uh, well, early teachers uh, teaching in the program. And this is uh, Dr. Ed Brotek, our first director, who uh, was on the search train. We rec recruited him, uh, called him Dr. Ed aff affectionately. And he's pointing to one of the images here of the uh, moons uh, basically eating uh, the sun. So, so the sun would be the ram white part, and this is the moon taking a cut. A bite out of there and here are the holes that are working these little holes the big ones didn't work for the little ones and you might remember Halima my uh, student at UNCA who published a paper with me on the uh, camera obscura she said that in, in the evening uh, where she could have a bit, pretty big hole uh, that would work she said the size of the penny when it was bright in the day when we get larger so it's amazing how these these holes here can act like a pinhole and get you this effect just amazing uh, here are some cool diagrams that help demonstrate what eclipses are. These are not the scale, but shows the shadow, say, of the moon uh, here on reaching to the Earth, and the uh, the lunar eclipse uh, where the moon goes behind uh, the Earth. And here, some of the light you know refracts, bends down, and since uh, light traveling through a lot of atmosphere it tends to look reddish, uh, yellow, uh, more like toward the red, like the red sunset then the moon can be bathed in, in red. And so the blood red moon. So we go ahead and made the, the moon red. i like to uh, just remind everyone here the dangers of looking at the sun. This amazing photograph of a, of a retina that's been damaged by the sun. Dr. Mark Clark from Anderson, South Carolina, let me get this picture from Dr. Hunter, an ophthalmologist uh, in the area. Here's a normal eye. Uh, there's your optic nerve, by the way, and uh, the myelin sheath is like an insulation, uh, and that's why it looks yellow. Uh, but in your fovea, the very, very detailed focus is here is nice, uh, less blood vessels, nice and nice, uh, smooth area there. Uh, it should not have this little white spot. This little white spot's a damage uh, by looking at the sun. At the time, they called it retinitis solaris. Uh, now I think it's more like uh, retinol uh, or ret retinopathy. I think now it's more like solar as uh, solar retinopathy is what they uh, kind of call it now. And I remember Dr. Mark uh, Clark telling me, amazing, the eye is like a camera. It like focused the light to that point there. And I says, but Mark, the guy's like blind, right? He says, well, well yeah, he's blind, but, but, but this beautiful physics, uh, the, the camera, the eye is like a camera, beautiful uh, biology 
I, and I said, but Mark, uh, we were like on a, on a trip, his wife and my wife up in the mountains in North Carolina. He visited me and I said, but Mark, like, I couldn't get over it, but the guy's blind, right? And he says, well, well yes, yes. And I, and I just couldn't get over that. But then he called me months later and he said a lot of healing took place and the guy was 2040. Now you can't fix that because the retina is shot. Um, but uh, 2040, and that's better than looking at someone and seeing a black hole and not seeing their face. You can at least, you can at least look and see someone to some extent. So I, I wrote a paper on this, and uh, this is very, very fascinating where biology and uh, here at physics overlap. Don't look at the sun. That's the paper, and a little PDF here if you want to read the paper. And another paper on total eclipse, uh, the one uh, from here, the famous eclipse that came to us in 2017. I'd like to uh, talk about that uh, slightly. Uh, here is a total eclipse that was in the our area. And this was, uh, it went to Greenville, South Carolina. And here are pictures of things getting dimmer and dimmer. And it reminds me of the Mark Twain story of a guy uh, yanking King over the score that goes back in time and it's going to get burned at the stake or something and say, I'll bring an eclipse block. I didn't say eclipse. I'll blot out the sun and you got to let me go. And, and so here's like it's getting darker and darker and people getting scared. Birds are getting confused and animals are getting confused. It's at nighttime. And then King Arthur in the story says, okay, let, let's let the guy go because uh, this is, this is not looking good. So let's look at a little uh, excerpt here from a video. Let's look at a little video, and this is uh, still from the video. Beautiful. This is the corona. This is actually when you can look at the sun safely because the moon is blocking the entire light. The damage that that uh, individual had earlier was, was by looking at the sun, um, let's say, gradually, you know, looking at the sun as the eclipse was taking place. And that was a partial eclipse so that never got covered anyway. So when it's totally covered like this, you can then uh, do it. So what you should do when you eclipse the day is wear these uh, special glasses. Make sure the glasses are not cheap, but they're the correct ones that filter out the uh, sun. So you can look directly at the sun with these glasses. And then when the moon blocks out the sun completely and you see the corona, you can then take the glasses off until uh, the, this phase is over. Each phase usually lasts about two minutes. At the max, it can last like seven and a half minutes, the total phase. Won't be long now. I think another 10 minutes up. Yeah. It moves real slow. Let's see if I can see the road. It'll come back. It'll last us to come back. This is like spectacular. So what is it from? That's maybe the white atmosphere. Is it going to Yeah. My sunglasses. You know that it's bright, but it's not. Sunglasses? Yeah. The Air Force Base up there. Looks a bit very dark. No. You know, 99% of things are just to get dark, but I just want to make sure that I can do it. I think in total what's up to the heart and the chest. Okay, Danny just texted me. Stop. But it's an eerie effect. It really is a nice effect. The, uh, all of the light on the left side. I know, isn't it crazy? He watching for the diamond ring effect. How long will it last? Uh, probably a second or two. No, keep on. Well, I mean, I mean, look over there. Woo! Oh, wow, it's gone. Gone. Woo! Oh, Diamond ring. Look at this. Diamond ring. April, look, 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 baby. Oh, I know. That's crazy. That is awesome. That is incredible, dog.
That's that amazing, is isn't it? Oh my god. It didn't get dark I thought it was. That is a, that is amazing. That is so unbelievable. I, I was figuring out that I didn't a year ago rent a hotel like I should have. So I'm thinking, what do you do now when you're desperate? And I thought, Bruce, he's the man. Like, and he should see it too. Bruce should see it. So I said, we do the plane deal. Absolutely. <laughs> and it worked out great. So I'm glad that. Wow, that was. That was. That is once in a lifetime. You know, that's once in a lifetime. Wow, and now it's like it's like jumping around. Was amazing. Chapter K aberrations. K zero aberrations. Now with aberrations, technically, nature's always doing the right thing. But aberrations are things we don't like. The image is not in perfect focus. And there's there's many of these, and we can see kind of why they would occur. If you work with the spherical cuts like we've been doing, we made the approximation that the sine of theta is approximately theta. This would be your paraxial approximation, but Really, the sine has a power series. The next term is theta cubed. This would be in radians now, over three factorial. And then fifth power over five factorial. And then seventh power over seven factorial with the signs alternating. How would you like to go back and do everything again with now adding that? No way, we don't wanna do that. So aberrations are very complicated mathematically when you put this next term in. This would be to third order, we did to first order. So you just look at the power. This would be fifth order if you did everything up to there, and then seventh order. So here, if you do to third order, you find aberrations. We're gonna list them and talk about them in our class. There are five, and we'll look at these in turn. A spherical, coma, astigmatism, curvature field or field curvature, and distortion or image distortion. So we're gonna go through these so we can understand what they are. The first one, Spherical aberration. This will occur with mirrors and lenses that are spherically cut. Spherical aberration. Here's a nice example with the mirror. At the rays that hit the outer parts, see, are not gonna focus you know, properly everywhere. In fact, you need a parabola. You need a parabola to get a, like a perfect focus at the focal point for parallel light coming in. And if you look at a parabola, it's not as uh, curvy as a, as a sphere. So if you look at a parabola, say that a sphere 
is going to be doing that, see? So near the axis, paraxial, see, basically the same. They are very close, but if you look farther away, this is curving too much, and that's gonna cause the problem. So you have spherical aberration. Now, when it comes to the lenses, it's about those outer portions, like getting away from the axis, that these rays here to hit the margins, they bend too much. The rays that hit inside more won't bend as much. So then you have your circles of confusion where your least circle confusion would be like right in there. Let's look at the diagram from the book. So marginal rays bend too much and the rays near the center, so they don't bend as much. And if you focused here on the marginal rays, you would have a fuzziness for the, the yellow ones coming in. And if you focused on the yellow, I put the screen where the yellow one is, then this big circle of confusion. So the best circle of confusion here is the one where the screen is placed right there. Here's the spherical lens, spherical aberration. And if they have an aspherical lens, very expensive, so you don't have the effect. Courtesy of my mentor, Richard Berg, Lecture Demonstration Facility, University of Maryland. When they were making the Hubble telescope, the Hubble telescope was supposed to be a different, you know, not, not spherical. Uh, it's very highly engineered design, but there was a flaw when they were making it and it was too spherical. So therefore spherical aberration kicked in. Uh, notice the concave uh, kind of surface here at the magnification of these folks. They're wearing the mask because they, are, they want to protect the mirror. So here's where two mistakes make a right. Once when that was in orbit, they couldn't really replace it easily, but they replaced the, like the eyepiece, like the other parts, the other op optics parts made it distorted so that distortion cancels distortion, basically. Aberration cancels aberration. You know, you, in other words, you, you make a, a lens that will take this light and make it look like this. So they fixed it. So this was the, uh, the uh, result without the changed optics. So that's where the mirror was defective, but then making defective optics lenses to compensate got this. Very exciting mission. And here is the crew that was on that mission that repaired the Hubble. Marvelous work. And here we have a physicist. Dr. Catherine Thornton, nuclear physicist, University of Virginia, uh, was a part of this uh, trip in the space. And uh, physics majors may know the Thornton book, which is her husband's a physicist, and the book, uh, Classical Dynamics of Particles and Systems by Stephen Thornton and Jerry B. Marion. Uh, that's her husband. And Marion was at Maryland when I was there. He passed away quite quite young in his early 50s. Uh, an outstanding teacher and uh, author of books, just amazing. Uh, with his work in, for example, in uh, pre-medical physics, lots of examples in uh, the medical field. And here, uh, Catherine Thornton uh, was invited with some other astronauts to go on uh, Tim Allen's uh, home improvement show and uh, where he d he uh, designed a tool well as part of the story and actually there's a video where he you know he asked them he says who used it in outer space and Catherine says I did and then they show a video of Catherine with the tool and she's spinning around in space and in other words the tool's not working properly so it's kind of a joke that Tim Allen has messed up in outer space. So that's cool episode 1996 there. 
And then she went back to Virginia uh, to work, uh, see, as a professor, like mechanical and aerospace engineering. Wow, very interesting. So if we move on to K2, and that's coma, we find that if we're off the axis, and these now here, I mean, these basically off axis aberrations, you can think of it, because if you're along the axis paraxial, you don't, really don't have them. You, they're very, uh, neglect. you can neglect them, for example, but here we're getting off the axis here. This will be imaged not as a point somewhere, but as like a little, has a little flare. Now, I'll get you a picture here. Coma, like a little comma. See cute little flares? Well, they're not, like, not cute. I mean, it's bad. You want it to have like the stars or points, points of light, not little, little flares like that. So we move on to the next one, K3, known as field curvature or curvature field or a curvature of field. And here, an arrow standing up there, if you have the lens, will actually be imaged in a curve. That's not good, all right? So that's the field curvature one. Again, off-axis, you know, aberration, off-axis aberration here, like off-axis aberration. And then if we go next, K4, astigmatism. Here, you find that if you look at the lens and the spherical lens, that if you're up here off axis, that these rays, and we're looking here at these rays, are gonna come like and focus, you know, focus someplace back here like this, all right? This point. And we'll consider this looking from the side, the side view. But if you look, say, from the top, like if that's me standing up, then you look at the top of my head, like the top of my head looking down, then these rays that fan in a different plane, see, this would be like looking from the top, this is a plane that would be perpendicular to this plane. You look from the side or you look from the top then these points, uh, I mean, this point here would be focused, and I'm exaggerating here for the effect just to show, you know, it's like somewhere else. So that means you can get these, these points would be blurred, like spread out. So that's another, you know, off axis, you know, aberration. Now don't confuse this with vision. When you have astigmatism and vision, they give you these uh, tests, they give you these lines, the test, and when you look at these lines, uh, sometimes a line is blurry along one of the uh, directions. So the test is essentially this kind of a test. And if it's blurry along one of the lines, then what they do is they wanna fix that angle so they'll give you a cylindrical cut for your lens so that along that axis it's curved, but along you know other axis it's not. So it's not gonna mess up other angles that you see correctly. So that would give you a cylinder. And then another uh, solution, of course, contact lens, is if you put a contact lens, say, on the eye, there is a fluid, you know, tear fluid level uh, layer. There's a tear fluid layer here, and then this is nice spherical. See, the problem with astigmatism is the cornea is not shaped properly. You, you got one problem there with the, the, the curvature. So this nice, a curvature here is going to, you know, fix that. And then when you give the prescriptions, they'll have things like this. The sphere, if you have myopia or hyopia, you just have a sphere. But the prescription will allow for another column, two columns in general, so that if you want to correct for astigmatism, you give, well, the spherical correction for the sphere because there may be a problem in all angles, but then for that special case to get that one line, that, that one direction fixed, uh, you have uh, another diopter uh, prescription and then give the axis. Uh, this is uh, interesting uh, here, the uh, old terminology, oculus dextrous, OD, and then oculus sinister. Sinister means 
left in Latin, but has become to me like like a bad name, like the left eye is like, or a left-handed compliment. So that came later. Okay, if we go on to the next one, and this would be K5. We have the image distortion, or simply distortion. And this arises well, we need to have a stop. We take a, you know, a camera, you have a stop, and the stop, you know, basically stops the light. But when you do this, if you have, say, a, like a tic-tac-toe here, like this, and now turn this to face the lens. If you turn that, you know, edgewise, you know, to face the lens, then you find if there's a stop here, like this, you get distortion. This looks like, a little bit like a barrel like that, and that's called the barrel distortion. The barrel distortion. And if you put the stop on the other side, then this like tic-tac-toe thing here, this is gonna look like, a, we call it the pin cushion, where it does something like this, the pin cushion. So you solve this problem by having two lens system you know, components and then put the stop in the middle and that it's gonna cancel out. So in the camera, you know, that will be done. Nice. And then we move on to the sixth aberration. Now this is not an off axis one. This is the one with color. This is chromatic aberration. And with chromatic aberration, see the colors uh, when they go through glass, gonna spread out. We don't like that, we call it an aberration, but then when it comes to diamond rings, we do like it. So humans are fickle. See an aberration is something we don't like, and we don't like it when we're trying to take a picture and the blue bends more than the red. So that here is then the focal point for the blue say here, and then the focal point for the red, red doesn't bend as much as out there. So if you put the screen where the red is, then the blue is a big fuzz. If you put the screen where the blue is, the red's a big fuzz, so the least circle of confusion would be right there, the compromise to put it there. So there's your red out here and your blue in there. One of my mentors at the University of Maryland Dr. Dieter Brill, a general relativity professor, worked with the light class for liberal arts students. And he says he remembered this when he was learning English, that the E sound, red, bends less, helped him remember that. See, when he's studying the E sound in English, it has all kinds of E sound pronunciations, but the E in red and the E in less have the same sound. Blue bends more or red, bends less. Here's a nice picture of chromatic aberration showing the blue bending more, the red bending less, and the green in the middle. And here, you know, if you were look at where the blue is, you got a big circle of confusion here. And if you look at where the red is, the big circle of confusion, but here is the least circle of confusion. So you'd want to put the screen, say, there to get the best effect. Here's a nice plot of index of refraction and wavelength, because this is the cause of it, the different index of refraction, different bending. Index of refraction for blue, a little bit more, see, than red. This is your visible region of the spectrum. And you can see that the glass here is fairly flat. You'll see 1.5 given for uh, crown glass, standard glass here. But notice that the blue is a little bit more index of refraction had than, the, than the red there. Here's a case of severe chromatic aberration. So now we go to the prism, and the prism gives us the spread of colors. If we look at the prism, and we have light coming in like this, here's a normal, you'd have color bending 
like that. And if you have your normal here, you're gonna bend away from the normal, so you're gonna come down. But the main thing here is that your white light spread out, red bends less, blue bends more, and you get this effect. So here, nice picture here, blue bending more than the red, see? Like the rainbow effect, prism action here, see? Very nice. And we can look at sending laser beams. Now laser beams are have monochromatic, they have one wavelength, so monochromatic light, so you can see it doesn't spread out, bend and go through here. And there's some neat prism physics we wanna look at now. And here, what we're gonna do is consider a prism Uh, let's say equilateral prism here, but it, it doesn't really matter, uh, really because this is the angle here, the apex angle. So uh, these angles down here, you know, all the angles don't have to be the same, that would be 60. It can, it can be a, a different angle, but here if we look at you know, light entering the side here, that you're gonna have light bend from air to glass bend toward the normal, and then when you get up here, when you go from glass to air, you're gonna bend away from the normal, right? Which is what we expect, like for our lens, you know, we basically have this kind of effect, conversion effect. Let's call this the air angle one, the air angle two, and see this light, want it to go this way, and this light here, if you go backwards, would meet it there, so this angle here is called the deviation angle you know, where the direction you're heading in and when you leave, you know, where, where they intersect. I'm gonna call this U1, V1, and glass angle one. And here we'll have a glass angle two. And we'll call this, uh, say here, U2, and this one in here, V2. I want to show you that this angle here is the same as the apex angle. And to do that, we look at this upper one, this upper angle here, say AU for upper. If you add to this, let's do this. If you add to this, the U1 and the V1, the U2 and the V2, you get yourself a 180. So this plus U1 plus V1 plus U2 plus V2 is a 180. Then if you look at these angles, these, this trio of angles, U, V, and G, that's a right angle, because that's a normal, normal's right angle. So therefore U1 plus V1 plus G1 is 90. And that happens also for the, uh, the second case over here, equals 90. And that means the U sum the U sum here, oh, U and V. The U, the U and V sum is 90 minus G1, and the U2 plus V2 is 90 minus G2. So if you add the V and U's together, you're gonna get 180 minus the G's. So this becomes uh, plus 90 minus G1 plus 90 minus G2, and that equals 180. And here, this all goes away, and you get the AU is the sum of the G angles, the glass angles. Isn't that cool? But look, A is also the sum of the G angles because it's an exterior angle. When you have the opposite exterior angle in the triangle, uh, you got it because see, G1, G2 in this angle are gonna be 180, but A in that angle is 180 also. So that's that uh, famous geometry. Um, relation that we, we have. So therefore, uh, the th this one here, which is say the lower one, is gonna be equal to the upper one. So it's gonna be equal. There's a nice diagram in your book, but I, I do try to draw all the diagrams myself. I think I encourage you to draw them also. It helps you learn better. And the deviation angle here, uh, we can get the deviation angle. Uh, that's simply the that's the exterior angle to these two, so the D is V1 plus V2. 
And here, also watch this trick. This angle A1 is the V and the G. So A1 is V1 plus G1. And A2 over here, same trick, is gonna be V2 plus G2. So that means the D angle here, if you, if, if you replace the Vs, you're gonna get, gonna get uh, A1 minus G1 and an A2 minus G2 because the, the V angles are A minus Gs. So there's your A minus G for the one, A minus G uh, for the second one. So that gives us the D is A1 plus A2 minus the sum of the G angles, but we already know that the sum of the G angles is the apex angle, we, we showed that already. So therefore D is A1 plus A2 minus the apex angle. So what we would like to do uh, next with this D is to get rid of that A2. So we have the input parameter, like when you're coming into the glass with the A1. So to do that, we need to use Snell's law. The uh, sine of A1 is going to equal N times the sine of G1. And we'll have that to be true for both sides. So this is the air in the glass, and on the other side, the air and the glass, uh, there's only one in here. This would be a sine of G2, all right? So then what we do next is we can uh, express, the, express the G1 and G2 as arc signs. This would be sine of A1 over N, and G2 is the arc sine of sine of A2 over N. So then A, which is the sum of the G's, we want to get rid of that second G. So that's going to be equal to uh, well, here's how we're going to say, so here's how we're going to work with this. We're going to say that the G2 is A minus G1. All right, so we're going to start playing around, simplify. And then this, this G2, we want to get rid of that. So if we're going to get this G1 goes in there. So therefore, G2 is A minus the arc sign of the sine of A1 over N. Now it's starting to get ugly here. But if you want to, to look at what the sine of A2 is, right? because we want to get rid of that A, at A2, see A2's got to go. So if you look at that sine of A2, that means the sine of A2 is N times the sine of G2, which is N times the sine of all this stuff, A minus, and just copying down from above, like there. And see, I want to get rid of that a2, I got to do another arc sine. This is awful. Look at this. So I have to do an arc sine of all of this, and S sine, and then the A minus this thing, like that. And then the D which is A1 plus A2 minus A. All right, so now I'm ready, I'm ready to go. So I have the D is A1 minus A, and then I have to add the A2, which is all this nonsense, the arc sine of N, and then the sine, 
then the A minus the arc sine. This is crazy. This is absolutely insane. And what we're interested in doing is to take the derivative with respect to a1 instead of it equals zero to find a minimum deviation, and there's no way we want to take derivatives of all those arc signs. We'll go crazy. So two things here. One, we can resort to that if you look at this and make this come in at a less angle, then this uh, here uh, won't bend as, as much. Like if you went straight in like this, you'd go straight through. So if you were imagine coming straight in through here, you go straight, but if you were a little bit to the side, then you would see you would bend. You could see that you're going to have a point where you're going to bend and go across here as a horizontal. And that, when you do that, when this lowers, this uh, angle here, this deviation angle is going to uh, change. So if we were to look at, say, that case where we come in and you just go perfectly across horizontal, and then you come out again, then you're looking at a very, very symmetric case here. Very symmetric, beautiful. This will be all lined up. And this will be A, and this will be A, and this would be G and G. They're all the same now. So in other words, A1 here uh, is the same as A2. And uh, here, if you were to continue this direction that way and, and come back like before, then see this angle here is not as great. This is gonna be your minimum case. Your minimum case, this angle here is gonna be the deviation at minimum. The angle will be smaller than the case we had over here where it's a, you know, it's a, it's a bigger angle. So then, if we have, these are all going to be equal to U and U uh, here, I guess it would be it down, down in there, and then V. So I drew a nice picture for you in the book that's cleaner, right? But see, once when you have this, now things are quite, quite sim simple. And the reason why we want to do this, I'll show you in a second, it's a nice logic here, where we shift focus now, and we want the deviation angle in terms of uh, the index of refraction. So now this becomes very simple. Simple. This is 2a. Well, a lot simpler. So the deviation angle is a 2a minus big A. And we want the little a now is going to be a plus deviation over 2. And when we do that, notice that the a here is going to be equal to the g's like before, which will be then 2g. So therefore, G will be A over 2. And watch the uh, Snell's law here. Sine of A is N sine of G. So when we look at that, we can see that the N is going to be the sine of A over sine, the sine of the ear angle over the sine of the glass angle. All right. And then... We can now write what the index of refraction is. The index of refraction is going to be the sine of the A angle. That's this little, little A angle. So that's the sine of the big A plus the deviation over 2. And the sine of G is simply the sine of A big A over 2. This is a beautiful formula. This allows you to play around with the laser beam and to find, you know, this case where it goes right across there, you get the minimum deviation. And once when you do that, if you know the angle A, like you have the index of refraction of the glass. Beautiful, beautiful example of math and experimental physics. Now for fun, uh, rather than use a symmetry argument, I actually made a plot of the different angles coming into the glass. In other words, here, I looked at di different A angles coming in and to see what the deviation would be. In other words, I plot this ugly formula using a spreadsheet. And I picked the angle to be 60 degrees at the apex. And I picked, so it's like an equilateral triangle. And I picked the, the glass to be 1.5. And I got this cool curve where the minimum deviation occurred at, at 49 degrees. And when I plug that in 
uh, to the formula to find out like what the glass angle would be, because that's the uh, A1 angle. I found that the uh, glass angle was equal to 30, but A are equal to the sum of the glass angles. If So this is 60, so that means the other one has to be 30. So like I showed it, I showed that the, uh, the glass angles have to be the same by the spreadsheet. Cool. Next section, K8. Abby, Abby number. Here is Abby. And he had, has a definition to measure dispersion by taking an intermediate index of a fraction, like a green, and he's gonna actually take yellow, but because of the strong lines from uh, in the sodium. But if you take the intermediate, subtract it from one, so you see what the index of a fraction, you know, the excess above one, and then divide by the difference of the blue and the red. Now this is this is a setup, just like a definition. So don't, don't we're not deriving this, although we'll see how powerful it is in a second. And this, he he picked here the D line. In, these are the front half of lines coming from the sun. The sun has all the colors, but then because of the atmosphere, it it gets light gets absorbed and sodium. See, so this is a famous doublet here. And then there's the F, the F line that's from hydrogen transition and another one from the C. So he's picking a blue uh, and a yellow and a red in his formula. So the formula is for the Abbe number here, V, the number is the index of a fraction at the D line, the sodium line, and subtract here at the bottom the F line, which is a blue line, and the C line. So what I'll often do is let me just call this yellow minus one, and then the blue minus red, because sometimes they pick a different blue line, use cadmium. Uh, this is a fascinating, uh, you know, chemistry stuff uh, coming in here because we're looking at the spectrum and optics, a lot of cool stuff. And uh, here you get, uh, well, an alternative is when you have the, uh, there's an alternative where you use the mercury line because they had trouble, you know, getting like the, the, the hydrogen lines and the sodium lines. So it was easier to work with mercury and, and cadmium. So when they do that, uh, they have have it set up where they put a D prime there. Prime, say, and C prime. So uh, that's neat. And, you know, those, those lines. Uh, and now we're going to move on to look at the A chromatic doublet. And Abbe number is going to come into play here. So let's look at the, uh, the camera. This is a cover of the physics teacher. That's my camera article I wrote. And notice there's a doublet here. There's a, there's a doublet, two uh, lenses together, uh, converging and diverging. This is for chromatic aberration. Notice the stop is in the middle to take care of distortion and lots of pieces of glass here to take care of all the other aberrations. Notice that when you stop down, you then leave out uh, the off-axis rays and have more paraxial rays and that helps things. So uh, like the pinhole camera, for example, you have the infinite depth of field. So that helps. So here you can see the, the light rays converging and then diverging to fix for the uh, aberration. Now it's not going to fix all the colors, but at least it's going to help to minimize things. That's what we like to do. But before we do that, let's talk about these key spectral lines. If you look at the hydrogen atom, which has a proton and then had these orbits, in the Bohr model, you have these orbits. And if you look at the second orbit, three, four, and you have transitions to the second orbit like this, these are the Balmer lines, the Balmer series, and four of them are visible. If you go from uh, three to two, you get the beautiful red, and that's the uh, that's this one here. Then C six five 
uh, six and nanometers. Gorgeous. And that, that red is all over the universe because when you have hydrogen, hydrogen's all over the place. And then when starlight, you know, fi fires up and gets those uh, hydrogen atoms excited, uh, ultraviolet light, for example, from nearby stars, and then when the uh, hydrogen has that transition, get back three to two, you get this bomber, like bar beautiful. Uh, photograph by Jason Ware, an excellent photographer of astronomy. And this is the uh, North America Nebula in Cygnus, the swan, and the pelican. And the pelican is looking at us in North Carolina. Isn't that cool? Right, beautiful. So that's all over the place. And then if you look at this uh, N, say F, that's the blue one, that's when you go from four to two. So if you go from four to two, you get this one in here. Uh, so this is the red one. This is the, uh, in the, in the bomber series. That's the uh, three to two transition. This is the blue one or, or cyan, bluish green, blue. And then there are two more uh, in the violet. Uh, so that would be, uh, you can think of it more energy to come from five to two or six to two, more energy and more energy in the light is translates as a higher frequency, uh, like the blue end of the spectrum, it's more energy and then comes ultraviolet even more in the next ray. So we'll be looking at that uh, somewhere later. And then the sodium one, the D one, beautiful sodium light, sodium street uh, vapor lamp. Look at that, nice, those three. Okay, so let's go ahead and do some designs. Time to design, and we wanted to design, let's say, something, we'll look at something like, like this, say, where this is one and this is two. And let's go ahead and, and do that. So before we, we get into specifics though, let's look at our formulas in general for the first lens, because you did see that in one case, this was a converging, uh, a second and diverging first. So we're not committing ourselves. Let's just write down the formulas. Uh, this would be for the first lens. We would have this relationship, one over R1 minus one over R2. This is a the formula from another part of our course. We're just pulling it out from before. And this would be for the second lens. And don't wanna to have to write down all these R's all the time. So let's just go ahead and call this constant one for now, constant uh, two. And notice that when you have the two lenses that they're gonna be touching. And if they're gonna to be touching, then you just have this effective focal length formula where there's, the D is zero. So then we have the formulas one over F1 is N1 minus one K one and one over F2, and two minus one, K2. And we can write down uh, the Abbe uh, relationship here, which, and I'm gonna use this form, that's gonna come in handy. But what we would like to do is say, can we make the effective focal length for the blue equal the effective focal length for the red. I mean, you got a lot of stuff to play around with here. You got the ends, for example, or things you can pick. You got the uh, ray eye of curvature you can pick. So let's go ahead and state this equality. So if that's the equality, then we have one over F1 blue plus one over F2 blue, using this formula, is one over F1 red plus one over F2 red. Okay, now when we get this, we're gonna plug in for the, we're gonna plug these in. So one over F1 blue would be here in one blue minus one K1. Now the K1's independent of the wavelength, but the, uh, the ends aren't. And then here, this is N2 blue minus, we're just copying this formula where we're looking at here at the blue. So the N has to be for the blue and that's K2, uh, and that has to equal, on the other side, the same thing for the red. So in one red minus one, K1 plus N2 red minus one, K2. And then what we do is we notice some cool things. We notice, for example, this K1 with the minus sign, K2 with the minus sign, has a K1 with the minus sign, and the K2 with the minus sign, all of those are gonna go away 
all right? So that means we're gonna have K1 times N1 blue plus K2 times N2 blue uh, is equal to N1, well, I'll put the K first, K1 times N1 red and then plus K2 N2 red, nice formula. And let's get the Ks, uh, let's get set up. We wanna basically find the ratio of the Ks. All right, so let's find out here K1 is gonna be N1 blue minus N1 red. And I like that the blue is first because the blue has a higher index of refraction than the red, so it's a positive number. And then over here, if I subtract, I'm gonna have here a minus K2 N2 blue, and now that over here on the right-hand side is gonna be a negative because the blue is gonna be bigger, so this is N2 red. So if I do that, I'm gonna put down a minus a K2, pull that out so that I have inside the parentheses the bigger one first, and that would be a positive number, but then I can see it's gonna be negative. So K1 over K2 is going to be, let's see what that is, it's gonna be Whatever is on the right hand side, because I'm dividing the K2 to the left, so I'm going to have this on the right left over like this. And I'm going to be dividing that by the one that was over here, N1 blue minus N1 red. Now comes the really cool stuff that's going to bring in the MA number. So we're going to write down here uh, for the yellow. If I have the yellow, what I'm gonna do is write down another equation. Uh, the surprise is coming up shortly, all right? Minus one, K1, and one over F2 yellow, F2 yellow minus one, K2. All right, now, why I'm doing this is because I wanna find another K1, K2 ratio, and when I do that, you're gonna get the AVE, the AVE never took the pop out, this is awesome, all right? So here, K1 over K2. Now we gotta be a little bit careful here because uh, there's a lot of stuff to keep track of. So let's say if a K1 is on top, I'm gonna have a one over F1 yellow, F1 yellow minus one. So uh, K1 is on top, so I'm bringing this down. So K1 is gonna be uh, let's let's do this. L let's do it in two steps. Let's say this K1 is one over F1 yellow and one yellow minus one. And then say K2 is one over F2 yellow and two yellow minus one. Now that, that's, that, that's easier to see. Then when I take the uh, ratio here, uh, the K1 is going to have, see, this on the bottom, and this is going to be on the top, so that's easier. That's easier to see. All right, minus one. Okay, so that gets it. So just to summarize that, the K1 is equal to the F, uh, Y yellow, this all on the bottom, K2 is similar, and then if I put the K1 over this, this is going to flip on top, going to have the twos on top. So that means these are equal, and if these are equal, then uh, here, watch this trick. Uh, if they're equal, then you're gonna have the F2Y, F1Y uh, with the N2Y minus one and the N1Y minus one. That's gonna have to equal this negative, 2B, 2Y, like that. So here, if we look at this, if you take the F2Y over the F1Y, like this, then if you, you bring, you're gonna bring this up to the right-hand side, this is the blue and the red, and we're gonna have here one yellow minus one, and then here, we're gonna have the one blue, and a one red, and that's gonna bring this one down here. This is the two yellow minus one, but now watch this. This one 
when you compare it with this one, that is the reciprocal of the Abbey number. So that means we have the Abbey number for the second lens in the bottom. And here, so that's going to be the, the one on top. That's the reciprocal. So this is saying that F1Y times V1 is equal to minus F2Y V2. And you can write this as the sum of these products is equal to zero. But the main idea here is that the focal length of the second one in the yellow is going to be given by minus the ratio of the Abbe numbers on yellow. And that will be helpful in our design. So let's go on and do some design work. And if we look at a convex converging lens that has the same radius of curvature, R and R, to simplify. And then we'll have an R over here, say R2 prime, which we don't know what this is, all right? But we're gonna set these uh, curvatures to be R, and we'll have to be careful with the signs. So in other words, the absolute value of the first curvature is gonna be R. This is the first lens, the second lens, and the absolute value of the second surface of the, of the first, lens, uh, first lens is gonna be R. So my notation will be used primes for the second lens here. So this would be R1 prime, and the absolute value there is gonna be R again. So you have R, absolute value for now, R, and then R, and then R2. So to set this up, we go with one over F1 is N1 minus one, and here's your R's, R1 minus R of R2. And for a converging lens, we know that the R on this side is gonna be positive. And the other R here, what's that gonna be? Well, you gotta be careful with these signs because some, some, sometimes you find these books will have a plus sign or a minus sign, but see, the mathematics is telling me what to do. If, if I put in plus capital R here and plus capital R there, I get, I get zero. I'm mean, gonna subtract, I get zero, which means that the focal length is infinity. It's got to, I got a regular piece of glass. That's clearly not the case. So that means that we're gonna be putting in R2 as a minus R, and it kind of makes sense that this is curved this way. If that's your plus R, this is curved the other way. So if we do that, then one over F1 is N1 minus like this, and then here you have two over R. So if this is the minus you know, R, then you're gonna have a one over R minus, and with a minus, two minus is gonna cancel there, and you're gonna get the two. So when you do that, I'm gonna pick the F1 to be 20 millimeters just to have an example here in my design. And if you do that, and if we're gonna pick the glass, uh, for the problem, I picked the glass here, the crown glass, which has the you know, Abbe number here and the index refraction uh, for, the, uh, for the yellow, all right, for, for the middle one. So that's gonna be important as we set this. So we're gonna be using these numbers. So when you use that number, 1.523, uh, you're gonna get uh, here, you're gonna get very easily by just putting in the numbers, this is gonna be 20 uh, millimeters, and then you just solve for R. You will get R is 20.92 millimeters, all right? So that's gonna be uh, the, uh, the curvatures. And then uh, we're gonna use now this cool formula that we did, we hit this one here. So that cool formula says we'll get the focal length for the second lens by the ratio of the Abbe numbers. And here, just remember that the Abbe number for the first one, we're using crown glass and dense flint. So the first one is the crown glass, and the crown glass would be 59.5 up top. And then for the second one is the dense flint, that's 32.3 and we stick a minus sign, and we know the focal length uh, for the, uh, the first uh, lens. Uh, essentially, we started with, with that as a, as a given. We're gonna pick 20 millimeters. 
So when you work that out, you get minus 36.84 millimeters. All right, so that's focal length of the next of the lens, which we expect. One's converging, one's diverging. That's what that minus sign means. So in the design of to fix for chromatic aberration, the achromatic doublet, also called the achromat, you have opposite type of lenses. Okay, so now we want to figure out what the situation is for that curvature, that last curvature. So we write down our formula again. And here I have the primes. And here, uh, we're going to look at this cut. Since this cut here now for the second lens is the opposite curvature, uh, we're gonna set this to be a minus 20.92. And we know that because this curvature, this cut is a diverging cut. And a diverging cut means you're gonna have a negative focal length. So that makes sense, uh, reinforces that, that we're doing the right thing at this curve, for this part being a con, you know, cur curved this way, for this lens, it's curved the other way. So in other words, this, if you go with the left lens, converging. This, if you go with the other one, diverging. What about R2? I don't know. So I'm gonna leave this as a minus sign here with R2 prime positive because this cut does correspond to diverging cut. And if it comes out negative, which it will, that means this is going to be actually bowing the other way. So you're going to actually have a case where we're going to show that it's actually going to bow a little bit that way, but not as much as this, as this cut. All right. But I don't know that. I don't know that yet. So we go ahead and plug in and we plug in here for the F2. This is your minus 36.84 that came from over here. And then we got that plugged in. The N2, uh, that's for the second glass. For the second glass, uh, that is 1.673. And then we can solve uh, here with the math and you get R2 prime is the surprise. It's a minus uh, 133.9. Now, it's supposed to be big because when it's, that's a weak power, it's not, it's not as strong. So now that minus sign means that our original assumption that this went in is incorrect and actually bows gently, but see such a large uh, radius of curvature, it's very gentle, very gentle, so that this will still be a diverging lens, this will win out. Uh, so what we can do for the uh, focal length of the combination, and this is gonna be for the yellow, you know, for that middle, uh, color. We then plug in our numbers, and if we plug in our numbers uh, here for the F1, we have the F1 and the F2 already figured out. Here's your F2 and your F1. We start up with the 20. If you do that, you're going to get 43.8 millimeters. So in other words, we start with a strong lens, the 20, short focal length, and then we put that diverging lens on there. It makes it weaker. So if you want to play with the powers here, it's kind of nice to go with the powers, that if you have the power of the first lens, that was the 1,000 over the 20, this is your power, that's going to be 50D. So I start out with 50 power, that's this lens, and I'm going to stick on there that diverging lens. But I know the focal length of the diverging lens, I figured out to be minus 36.84. And if I do that, I get then here a minus 27.1 diopters. And then the power for the combination, my combination here is 43.8. And it's good to keep the uh, four significant figures before you uh, round off. And that gets you 22.9 diopters. But the beauty of all this is that you could you could notice that P1 plus P2 is going to give P. So if you add these together, the negative sign you subtract, you're going to get then 22.9. See, so 22.1, you, know, you, know, you get this. So if you, you combine these two together, you get that one. That's kind of neat. So before we leave today, let's talk about the uh, gems. Look at that. This is K, uh, K10 gems. Beautiful diamond engagement ring. And when we look at this, I, 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 liked, I like this table, the Mo scale, which shows you like, like here gems, like diamond, topaz, quartz. 
and you can hurt the one above you. In other words, if you a diamond can cut corundum, can, can cut topaz, can cut go all the way down. So if, this is like a superhero here, like diamond is like a superhero. Uh, if talc wants to challenge diamond, that this powder is gonna, you know, it's gonna like destroy itself. Like if someone punched a super a hero, it, they hurt themselves. So here, you know, this is the order. So the diamond is like the strongest, and then uh, sapphire, ruby. See, my, my dad had the old record player, had a diamond needle, he's proud of that. The diamond needle lasts a long time. Of course, you're cutting into those vinyl records and wearing them out. Um, but the cheaper uh, was a sapphire needle, but the diamond needle, very nice. And you can cut diamond, can cut diamond by you know making one diamond more like a point like this and have more pressure. Diamond can cut diamond. So that's very, very cool to see that. And then the gemstones, very nice. The birthstones, rather. The birthstones here uh, for, your, for your month. All right, isn't that nice? Uh, before I leave, I'd like to kind of add a K11, talk about the eye and, and aberrations. The eye corrects for aberrations in an ingenious way. So here's your cornea and here's your uh, crystalline lens. And then you have your, your iris, your stop. Notice that your stop is in the middle of two lens uh, systems. Um, that, that's good, we, we saw that, the minimized distortion. And the cornea is not spherical because the sphere, the outer rays bend too much. So the cornea is flatter here, flatter than it is at the center to help correct for that. And also, you may have remembered that the index of refraction of the eye lens was more in the middle and less here. That already you know, corrects for like the spherical aberration where you have too much bending at the edges while the index refraction is less there. And then if you uh, look at uh, the, the fovea back here and the retina, uh, you find that there's uh, some blue, there's some blue absorbing uh, material in the uh, fovea, macula lutea, mac Lydia, and that absorbs blue. The lens also absorbs short wavelengths, all right? And that's why it's not good to be exposed to ultraviolet light out, outdoors, you get cataracts, so you want to be careful. But see, this is a downplays the short wavelength. You absorb some blue back there, and also the, the fovea there has a shortage of blue, so-called blue cones, all right, to counteract for chromatic aberration. And also, in the uh, fovea, the little receptors here, kind of point you know, the wrong way, the light comes in this way, and it's like total internal reflection. The Stiles Craw Crawford C, R -A -W, Crawford effect, and that keeps things on axis. And also the fovea is pretty much on axis, which means you gotta look on axis to see something. So, so that means that you minimize uh, the uh, off-axis aberrations, all the off-axis aberrations. So that is cool, how the eye is very, very powerful and does all that. And if it's bright and sunny out, the, uh, you'll stop down more. And if you stop down more, the rays will be even more paraxial and you get more like a pinhole camera and it sharpens things up too. Marvelous.